If I were to begin this afternoon by saying, didn't the Spirit directly just move you? Now, if I were expecting a legitimate answer, what in the world would I expect to hear if I polled each one of you? You don't know anything that the Spirit has to say if you don't read it in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians six seventeen. The sword of the Spirit is the only way that God communicates how one becomes a Christian and how one is faithful. We're not talking about what all God does providentially on our behalf. <clears throat> Show you an example of that. Tell me what angels are doing particularly and specifically right now you have no idea what is the father doing specifically give me a detail right now and you could ask that about any of the beings in heaven you could even go to the Hadean world place of departed spirits where the dead go awaiting the end of the world and the resurrection and we know Abraham was in paradise because Jesus said he was in Luke 16. Now tell me what Abraham's doing right now. I don't know. And you know, living my life on this earth to be faithful to the Lord according to his word, to a great extent, I don't care. Now that doesn't mean I don't care what the Bible says. It doesn't mean I don't care about things that the Bible defines to be spiritual. It just means, first of all, my finite human mind at this time cannot form a picture of eternal things and things that are not material and time-bound, except by the way the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, reveals them to me and the ideas God has put into those words. And I promise you, we can't understand what it's like to exist outside this body in another place, in another state of existence. But we know the Bible tells us that such is the case. So what should concern us? Our concern should be to do what the Bible says the way the Bible says it for the reason, or maybe there's more than one reason the Bible says it. If he says when we ought to do it, we ought to be concerned about that. Because that's the way that you are spiritual on this earth in this fleshly body in time and space is to do spiritual things. What spiritual things? What the Word of God says is spiritual. So when we engage in singing in the worship of the saints, then that's spiritual. When we worship God, as we sang in that song, in spirit and in truth, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, when it comes to singing, when on the first day of the week in the worship assembly, we observe the Lord's Supper, thinking about the bread, praying before we partake of it, what it represents, and saying concerning the fruit of the vine. But there's a lot of folks that equate whatever goes bump in the middle of the night to be something spiritual, either coming from some loose demon or an angel that stumped his toe somewhere in the whatever. And you say, you're making light of that. I'm not making light of the people that believe it. I'm just simply saying if you're going to follow that direction, there's no telling where you're liable to go because it's not anchored in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. But the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, the instrument the Spirit uses. And it's the only way we can understand God now. And it's the only way we can understand what being a Christian is and how to become one and how to live a righteous life. Now this morning in talking about the Holy Spirit, proving Christ to be the Son of God, we noticed that it was done by miracles, signs, and wonders. We noticed that the apostles of Christ, those he chose to reveal the New Testament through, that they proved that their message was from heaven and not from men by the miracles, signs, and wonders that they received in the baptismal measure of the Spirit that you can read of in your own Bible in Acts chapter 2. Now, concerning that, I would like to continue this afternoon. Again, I say that 
In Acts 2, 1 through 4, we read of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles of Jesus Christ. They're there according to the directions of Christ to tarry ye in the city until ye be endued with power from on high. So that's what they did. It was promised then that the Holy Spirit would guide them in their preaching. They're fallible human beings. They can't depend solely upon their human powers. So you will see that as you read Acts 2 on the day the church was established and the gospel is first preached in its fullness, that they speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. They had been told that in John 14, 15, and 16, that it would be the Holy Spirit who would take Jesus' place once he returned to heaven, was sitting at the right hand of God ruling, and so the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Lord also promised that signs would accompany them. We read about that, Mark 16, 15 through 20. And in Acts 2 and verse 43, the day the church started, we read this, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Not only was it a signal from heaven without man being involved in these miracles that said they were speaking the will of God, because remember there came a sound down from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, but there wasn't any wind. And cloven tongues set upon each of them, the them being the apostles. And that's when they began to speak. One of the signs was the speaking with what Mark 16, 17 calls new tongues. On this day, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the apostles of Christ spoke with, Acts 2 verse 4, other tongues. Now there were Jews present, according to the scriptures, from every nation under heaven, Acts 2 and 5. And every man heard them speaking in his own language. Now I want you to notice as you go through this that language and tongues are used interchangeably to mean the same thing. So you have a divine definition here. To speak in a tongue is to speak in a language. And you can read that in chapter 2, verse 6. What was the impact upon the audience that heard them speak? Well, the scripture says, they asked themselves, and how hear we every man in his own language wherein we were born. Verse 8. They also said that we hear them speaking in our tongues the mighty works of God. Chapter 2, verse 11. Now this tells me that these tongues were not some sort of gibberish or unintelligible sounds. They were speaking by miracle in languages that could be understood by the people who were born to that language. And they understood it in their own language. Those who claim to speak in so-called unknown tongues are first of all not paying very close to the text. Because if you look where it has unknown tongues, you will see unknown in italics. Now if you know anything about translation at all, you'll know that the translators supplied that trying to say that these were tongues, languages not known by the hearers. But that's not the way people will read it. They read it as if it is a language not spoken anywhere on earth by anybody. And some people have even said it's angelic language. But at least the angels understand that. And it's intelligible. But that's supplied by the translator. It's not in the original Greek the Holy Spirit gave the penman. It's unknown in the sense that if you speak a certain language and somebody else is speaking to you in a language you don't know, then the language you don't know is an unknown tongue. It's that simple. We have an example of that that goes on since our Spanish brethren are now meeting with us. They have their worship here in the morning while we're having our Bible classes. 
and then we swap. We come out here and have our worship, as we are now, and they meet there for their Bible classes. Then we meet for our afternoon services here, and they meet at 6 on Sunday evening. Now, why do we do that? Because they have so many that speak Spanish and understand Spanish, or at least they do to the point where in their own mother tongue they understand it much easier than they do a second language, which would be English to many of them. Not true of all of them. Many of them speak English quite well. But I'm telling you, when they are speaking fluent Spanish to one another, it's an unknown tongue to me because I don't understand it. And one of the miracles that existed on the day of Pentecost was that when all those apostles stood up and they spoke by a miracle from the Holy Spirit, they spoke to all those people in their own tongue wherein they were born. And you know, even to this day, if you were born speaking English, you may be very talented in language and speak three or four or five other languages. But you will still feel more comfortable in your own native tongue. So we need to understand some common sense it needs to be used in the definition of terms and understanding something about the translation of the Bible. Consider now also the coming of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles. Gentiles, non-Jews. In this case, I'm speaking of uncircumcised Gentiles because on the day of Pentecost there were proselytes and those were Gentiles who chose to live according to the law of Moses. They were some of those converted on the day of Pentecost. But we're talking about uncircumcised Gentiles that a Jew wouldn't have anything to do with. And if you read Acts chapters 10 and 11, you'll see that Peter made it clear that they didn't. They had to have a special revelation from God that the uncircumcised Gentile had a right to the gospel as much as the Jews and proselytes did. That's the burden of Acts 10 and 11 as the gospel was beginning to spread throughout the world. Because the New Testament was delivered in part and parcel. What does that mean? As they needed it and as the church developed, then that part of the gospel was given. Paul says we know in part and we prophesy in part. What does that mean? That's what I just said. That as you have need, then that is given as far as revelation is concerned. That's one reason it took several years to get the whole of the gospel out there confirmed by the miracles and written down into the perfect law of liberty, James 1 and verse 25. So when you open your Bibles to chapter 10 of the book of Acts, Luke tells us about the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. And that was Cornelius and his household. But we see that that was for a different purpose than when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles of Christ. This purpose was to show the Jews that God authorized the uncircumcised Gentile to receive the truth also. It's very difficult for us to understand how prejudiced the Jew was because of the law that he'd been under for 1,500 years, and added to that was a lot of customs that weren't necessarily sanctioned by the law that kept them totally separated in about every way from an uncircumcised Gentile. In fact, Peter makes it clear to Cornelius, you know how that it's unlawful for one that is called a, a, a Jew to come into one who's a Gentile. But he also then made it clear that God has showed me not to call something common that he's cleansed. Peter recognizes an apostle of Christ. Something special is going on here. There's a difference now under the gospel system as to who should hear and obey the gospel. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Peter identified it as such in Acts chapter 11, verses 15, 16. When he rehearses what transpired at the house of Cornelius to the Jews in Jerusalem who questioned him for doing that. Now the purpose of this baptism directly from heaven, not involving men, is clearly seen in the use that was later made of it. Now here is one of those cases to where baptism means a total immersion in something. That's the idea of the Holy Spirit, total immersion in power. 
to provide something as he did with the total immersion in power of the apostles. Peter related at Jerusalem the incident to remove any doubts which the Jews had as to, as I said earlier, the propriety of baptizing Gentiles for the remission of sins, Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. And the best I can say is read Acts 10 and then read very closely Peter's rehearsal of those events in uh, Acts chapter 11. Now notice something about a design. In this case, there was design to the Holy Spirit doing this with Cornelius and his household. You must understand that a design is external to themselves. That is, it is showing something to somebody else. In this case, God coming directly down from heaven in the form of the Holy Spirit and engulfing the Gentiles with power, and they proved it because they spake in other languages that no man knew, but they could only speak in them because of a miracle. And Peter could only remember another time like this happening. And when he reiterated that or reminded them or recounted the event to the people in Jerusalem, he says, as on us at the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of the Lord's church on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. It's exactly what went on. Now, it's important to understand that once a thing is demonstrated, it need not be demonstrated time and time and time and time again. It's done. And once God had showed everybody that the uncircumcised Gentile had the right to have the gospel preached to him and obey the gospel just as much as a Jew did, it was done. Now this caused a problem in the church because there were those Jews who obeyed the gospel and we learn from Acts 15 they had been of the sect of the Pharisees that still wanted to say, now you uncircumcised Gentiles must believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and then be circumcised, keep the law. And Paul wrote the book of Galatians severely denouncing that view and when you read Acts 15, it deals with it too. They just could not turn loose of the law. And they were going to make the Gentile converts, basically, second-class citizens. But that was not the case. The baptism in the Spirit didn't save Cornelius and his friends. They are those who have taught that it did. It was not for that purpose. It was for the purpose of showing those Jews that the Gentile has a right to the gospel, has a right to become a Christian. The angel had previously told Cornelius that Peter, listen, shall speak unto thee words whereby thou shalt be saved, thou and all thy house. Acts 11, verses 11 and 14, or rather 13 and 14. Now here's the point. Do you see the difference in the why and the purpose and the reason for Holy Spirit baptism at the house of Cornelius? But they all had to believe the same gospel. Remember, it's God's power to save, Romans 1.16. They all had to believe the same gospel. That's the same gospel to be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15. So it's uh, obvious then that once you've established that the Gentile has a right to the, the gospel then that gospel is preached. Now, how is it preached? It's preached in words, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. No wonder then Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Thus, the will of heaven is in the ideas of heaven, which ideas are in the words of heaven. In the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God. So they were saved by words when they heard and understood. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And in hearing the gospel, in those words, they understood the plan of salvation. Having believed, they were taught to repent of their sins, confess their faith in Christ, and be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. Now that has to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit 
and the miracles that took place with Cornelius and his household, the purpose and design of it, it happened only one time. There's another important point to keep in mind. Now, this is one baptism, and Acts 2 is another baptism. But when you get to Ephesians 4 that was written in about A.D. 62, the Holy Spirit himself said the one baptism. Now, how do I know out of the baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament which one is the one baptism of Ephesians 4? Well, there is a baptism to be preached until the end of the world. Now, what is it? It's the one you hear and believe and you're baptized for the remission of sins. That's what they were commissioned to do. Now, if it's to be preached to the end of the world, and there's only one baptism in A.D. 62. And that baptism involved being buried in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins. And what baptism do you think it is? It has to be the baptism of the Great Commission. Not the baptism that came upon the apostles of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. Nor the baptism of suffering of Jesus Christ. And it's called that because he was engulfed in, in suffering. Or the baptism that had to do with Cornelius. And certainly it wasn't the baptism that was administered by John the Baptist to get the people prepared for the Christ. I don't care how many baptisms you've got before, before AD 62 in Ephesians 4. There's only one by then. Now, in right division of the word, you may want to know the difference in those baptisms. That's good. But when you get to Ephesians 62 or written in 62, in Ephesians 4, there's only one. And there has to be a way for us to figure it out. And it's the one to be preached to the end of the world because that one is the baptism for unto in order to a given end the remission or forgiveness of sins. It's not any of the others. And that must be understood. In fact, at the household of Cornelius, Peter would say, after having seen the miraculous events that said the Gentile had a right to the tree, or rather to forgiveness of sins, and thus the tree of life eventually if they're faithful unto death, can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized? Peter understood that Holy Spirit baptism didn't save them. He understood it said they had a right to be saved, and they needed to believe and obey the gospel where God's located his saving power. There's another point that needs to be made by those who claim miracles even today because only, only the apostles had power to confer the miraculous gifts of the Spirit on certain members of the church. No one else enjoyed this authority. And those who received these gifts from the apostles could not, they themselves could not confer them on others. And we'll show the proof of that. You'll remember that Philip went down to Samaria from Jerusalem. And he's evangelizing. He's preaching the gospel. And you'll remember that he worked certain miracles. Now, why did he do that? Well, he wasn't an apostle of Christ, so he wasn't baptized in the baptismal measure of the Spirit. Well, how did he get those gifts? had to be through the laying on of the apostles' hands that they conferred that gift to him. Because the record says that the people hearing him preach saw the miracles that he did, which miracles, remember, were designed to confirm that his message was from heaven and not from men. In Acts 8, verses 14 through 17, the scripture reads, Now when the apostles that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet it was fallen upon none of them, only they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Mind you, through Philip's preaching of the gospel and his proof that he was preaching it from heaven by the miracles he did, but he couldn't confer those miracles on anybody else as they had been conferred upon him. Then the church sent apostles to him so that they could lay hands and confer gifts of the Spirit. Such gifts as are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. 
So they'd been baptized. They were Christians, but they had not received any miraculous power. So the church sent Peter and John, apostles of Christ, to lay hands on them that they might receive that miraculous power, even as it had been done with Philip. Now, Acts 8, 5 through 8 makes it clear that Philip, in preaching the word to them, had proven that it was from heaven and not from men by the miracles that he did. And it was not the miracles that astounded these people. It was the gospel message that astounded them. The miracles just proved that that message was from God and not from man. Philip received this miraculous power, as I said earlier, as a result of laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, it's been mentioned that many signs accompanied Philip's preaching when he was preaching the gospel in Samaria in Acts 8, 5 through 8. So I must ask the question to further investigate this. Where did he get the power to perform miracles? Surely if you've listened so far, um, your appetite's whetted enough to get an idea about where he did. Well, remember, he was one of the seven that was chosen to look after some benevolent work in the church of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, we have this comment and excerpt from those passages. It says, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands upon them. So I think it's plain to see that this power came to Philip through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. He certainly had not received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, for that was reserved for the apostles of Christ only. He certainly was not an uncircumcised Gentile, because that wouldn't take place as far as the record in Acts, till a few chapters later. Well, how are people to know when Philip goes preaching in Samaria that his word is the gospel and from heaven or from men? Because there had been hands of apostles laid on him and the miraculous gift was given him to work miracles. Paul did the same thing. That is, he conferred this kind of power on 12 men he baptized in Ephesus. In chapter 19 of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 7, we find the record of these 12 men being baptized. They had heard the word, but it was the preaching of John the baptizer. Now, his message was to get people ready for Christ. They knew only the baptism of John. Well, that was all well and good while it was in effect, but once Christ came, Suffered, bled, and died, raised the dead, went back to heaven, and the church starts in Acts chapter 2. Great commission baptism is not in effect. Not get ready for the Messiah, but to obey the gospel to gain remission of sins and become a Christian. And he asked them certain questions. And by the way, there's authority for us to ask people questions about their baptism. And he asked them about the Holy Spirit, because you see you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they said, we've not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit or not. Well, how could you have obeyed the gospel and not so much as heard whether the Holy Spirit? So the answer they gave and the ignorance it revealed told Paul, you have been taught the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is taught in the Great Commission. So when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Thus he took them and baptized them, and that's the result of it. Because, you see, without the completed written New Testament, people had to have guidance from heaven to live faithful Christian lives. And these miracles were designed to last until the full revelation of Jesus Christ, our New Testament was revealed, confirmed by miracle signs and wonders, and completed. So we've seen in this study that miraculous gifts could be conferred only by an apostle. No one else could. Now here's what we learn from this. When the last apostle died, the power to confer miraculous gifts expired. Now listen. 
And when the last person on whom an apostle had laid hands died, the performance of miracles by men in the church ceased forever. Because by that time, the full New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, was written down, confirmed to be from heaven and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders, and we have it today. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 13, how long these gifts were to continue. He said, till we all attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a full-grown man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. They were to last as, until the full knowledge of God was written down. Somebody says, I'd like to see a miracle. I'll read you one. I mentioned this morning, the first part of this lesson, that just because something happened 2,000 years ago doesn't change its veracity. Truth doesn't change with time. You know, you can go out here and look at tombstones and see somebody that died 150 years ago. Well, what about those graves undiscovered? Does that mean they've changed in the sense of who they were and the date they were born and the life they lived and the date that they died just because time has gone by? Certainly not. Truth does not change with the changing of time. So when the scriptures were completed and confirmed by miracle signs and wonders, then the purpose and design of miracles had ceased. Paul, immediately following his discussion of spiritual gifts, which began in 1 Corinthians 12 and goes through um, 13 and 14, explains the expiration of such gifts. In fact, Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 8, ought to be studied along with these three passages in 1 Corinthians. He says, Whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, remember how we define and let the Bible define languages, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish or be done away. Now let me pause there just for a moment. You know he couldn't be talking about knowledge in general because he wrote those words so people could be enlightened. And you know you still, by self-evident, learn things so he can't be talking about knowledge in general. He's talking about the miraculous knowledge that came to people without them having to study it. Then he said, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. I think it's evident that these spiritual gifts were not intended for all time to come. Prophecy shall be done away. Tongues shall cease. Knowledge, miraculous knowledge, shall be done away. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes about it. When would that take place? Well, according to the very words of the Spirit through the pen of Paul, when that which is perfect is come, verse 10. And you have then James saying, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1, verse 25. You have the mind of Christ in the New Testament of Christ. You have all of it. It is sufficient to make you a Christian, to keep you faithful, and deliver you to heaven. And it has been confirmed by miracle signs and wonders, wonders in the form of things done no human could do except God be with him. The miraculous gifts of the Spirit then ceased after the completion of the work for which they were given. Namely, the revelation and the confirmation of the complete will of God. That's why we're taught as the book of Revelation closes that John the testator said this, speaking on behalf of Christ, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. That's saying this is it. You look at Paul's writing in Galatians 1, 
He makes it clear there's one single solitary gospel. And I preached it to you people and proved it was from heaven and not from men by the miracle of signs and wonders I did. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. So when you study the work of the Holy Spirit, you have the words of the Holy Spirit telling you all these things. And that's why that we must study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's our responsibility. We must be honest of heart when we do it, Luke 8, 15. The other was in 2 Timothy 2, 15. So all I can say at this point is that you must continue to study. You must continue to trust in God based upon His Word. I hear people say sometimes, well, I just believe that's so-and-so. If you can't find it authorized by Christ and His words, then you have no right to believe that it's so. You can't just say, well, I think it's this way or I believe it's this way and God's for me. That completely overrules and turns wrong side out and destroys Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. But since faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and we walk by faith, not by sight, then we're walking as the word of God leads, guides, and directs us. That's the reason we're always pointed back to the Word of Christ. Now the Word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Can you preach anything any more piercing than that Word when it comes to learning about sin? being lost in the way of salvation in the gospel of Christ? I think not. It's the way the Spirit converts us to Christ. It's the instrument the Spirit uses to convert us to Jesus Christ. That's what's meant in Ephesians 6, 17 when it says the sword of the Spirit. The instrument the Spirit uses to convict men of sin and to convert them to Christ because it's the Holy Spirit that revealed the Word of God to all men. And that's what's meant when it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you're not a Christian, we've studied what to do to become one. If as a child of God you sin, he has a second law of pardon. That's repentance and confession of sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. If you need to do either one of those, then we urge you while yet time remains to arise and obey the truth while together we stand and sing.